you are in a field by yourself with no clothes, no possessions, no trophies, absolutely nothing, just you by yourself, you're enough. You always have been and you always will be, no matter what. Because I always felt like I had to have something to be enough. I had to achieve something to be enough. And I think we all can relate to that. Realizing that was such a huge shift for me. Because then I started doing things, not because I wanted to win or be the best or because I wanted love, it was just because I think you gotta have a dream. The school of greatness. Really? <laughs> yeah. Please welcome Lewis Howes. You've been successful since pretty much the moment you came into the TV Hollywood scene. Right. You've accomplished, <laughs> you've won awards, you've been judging on massive shows, you, you keep accomplishing. Uh, but there were certain lessons emotionally that you've learned, mm. especially over the last few years that have helped you elevate as a human being. What would you say are a couple of the lessons that you've learned the most in the last few years that have really helped you with your inner world, yeah. Yeah. not just the accomplishments and the success from the outer world? And then I wanna talk about how you've accomplished your success as well. Dude, well, first of all, it's a pleasure being here, my man. Yes, my and man. I, I'm, I'm in the, I'm here. This is this is the school of greatness. Finally, man, we made it happen. It's amazing, man. And I'm, uh, so, so I don't know, for me, to answer your question, Something that I've learned along the way, you know, my whole life has been a competition. Yes. My entire life. Yeah. Even from growing up. I mean, I had four sisters. I was the only boy. And so, you know, competing for attention. <laughs> like, you know, hey, look at me, look at me. And, and then, of course, becoming a competitive dancer. Mm -hmm. It was always about judging, being judged and becoming, wanting to get the best. And then being on Dancing with the Stars, you're being judged in front of millions of people. Yeah. And there's this pressure. And there's like this feeling and desire of wanting to win and be the best. And one thing I realized along the way that really, really helped me tremendously and transformed my whole life experience was realizing, and it actually happened to me when I was in my apartment in Los Angeles. I had won Dancing with the Stars for the third time. And I, had, I was a world champion Latin American dancer before Dancing with the Stars, you know, won all these big competitions. and peaked, you know, in that. As a ballroom dancer, right? As a yeah. ballroom dancer, yeah. yeah. Traveling around the world, you know, I peaked in that. And then I'm on the TV show and I've now won it more than anybody else ever had, like three times, and I'm, I'm feeling like super depressed. Really? And I'm like, and I felt super lonely. I felt just in a dark place. And I was like, what the heck is going on, man? I feel like I should be like buzzing right now. And what I realized, I had this, massive emptiness looking at all this hardware mm. all these trophies because I realized that my whole life I really felt like success equaled love Ooh. I felt like achievement equaled love and in order for me to get love I had to become something I had to be mm. good at something I had to be the best and then I would be worthy of love and what I realized was like, wow, that's not the case. That's not the case. Because once you, we all know, once you achieve something, you're just like, all right, what's the next thing? Yeah. So you never really fully feel resolved or feel. Did um, you feel loved at all when you accomplished those things? For a, a second. 10 minutes, right? Like that. God, we're very similar, man. Dancing with the stars, like for a good example, it's like the biggest high, you know, like there's like confetti everywhere, screaming, you know, everybody's happy. You're on you're the good morning, America. You're on your morning. private jet, you know. Good morning, America. You wake up the next day, and for the longest time, I had this such a huge and negative association with New York, because every time I'd go there for GMA, I was so depressed. Like I would be on the show or afterwards. After the show. So you'd be like celebrating on the show, and then you're like, okay, no one cares anymore. And, and then <laughs> I was, just, I was just like, oh, now what, you know? But what helped me throughout that whole journey was realizing that. Somebody told me this actually. They said, listen, man, if you are in a field by yourself with no clothes, no possessions, no trophies, absolutely nothing, just you by yourself, you're enough. That's it, you're enough. You always have been and you always will be, no matter what. And that struck a chord in me because I always felt like I had to have something to be enough. I had mm. to achieve something to be enough. And I think we all can relate to that. It's a deep fear of all of ours, you know, am I enough, you know? And realizing that was such a huge shift for me. Because then I started doing things and, you know, performing or creating, not because I wanted to win or be the best or because I wanted love. It was just because, 
I wanted to do it for the joy of it and for the love of it while realizing that I didn't have to do it in order to, to, to receive love mm. or to feel loved. Yes. Not just from other people, but for myself. You know, and so that that was a huge shift for me. And it's interesting because after that shift, I can look back at my sort of career and I can think, oh, so many things just accelerated so much from that point. When was this point? This point was right after I danced. Um, it was actually when I danced, after I danced with Sean Johnson. Uh -huh. And I actually became yeah. second that year. Wow. And I remember feeling really deflated, really disappointed because I was like, oh, sure, we had it in the bag. and. Um, but it was so good for me because it, it, it got me to that point realizing, you know, uh, why, why am I doing this again? Why, why am I doing this? Why am I dancing? Why am I performing? This all just seems so pointless and frivolous and use like, who cares about any of this stuff? Mm -hmm. And then I realized the importance of it, you know, not just for me, but just bringing joy to people. And, and, you know, I was in the hospital with my mom, actually, she had fallen and hurt her head mm -hmm. and. There's somebody next to her and I was really contemplating giving up the whole thing. I was just like burnt out. I just didn't enjoy it anymore. And she was just like, I just love watching you on the oh. show. It just means you know, so much joy. I look forward to it every week. And I was like, man, I'm being so selfish right now. Thinking like, oh, I'm, I'm so over this and I'm so done. I'm so burnt out. And because I was thinking about myself, you know, I wasn't thinking like, oh, how can I like bring joy to somebody else? How can I bring joy to others? And it's so much, a, so much more of a sustainable energy. Because mm -hmm. up to that point, it was all about me. I was like, I want to be the best. I want to be get good. And That's I, exhausting. I, and it was, by the way, it worked. It did work. It you worked got results. For a certain amount of time. Yeah. But it's temporary. You can't, you, that's not sustainable. That's not a sustainable energy to think like, to think about you. Yeah. It might work for a little bit of time, but a sustainable energy and a sustainable thing that will get you through the longest time is how can I serve this person? How can I give my talents or the things that I've trained for? How can I like uplift somebody or how can I give something? And um, man, I just like, my batteries just got like rebooted. I just had this like copious amounts of energy and you know, started going on tours and, cr and creating these opportunities, creating tours, creating, you know, show concepts and just creating all this stuff. And then just so many things started to grow from that. Wow. And it's pretty cool, man. It's pretty neat. And we were talking beforehand about you've always been like the positive guy. Like right. every time people around you are like, you were like the positive, <laughs> hey, everyone's happy, everything's good. Yeah. Um, and I'm, I would say I'm a very positive person as well. I'm always coming from a place of like gratitude and appreciation and positivity. But sometimes there are things that will trigger us or affect us or that make us feel angry. But you, you mentioned that you never really allowed yourself to feel anger. And I think that's great to come from that as a baseline. But when something happens or you go through an experience that really triggers you or makes you angry, what have you learned about allowing yourself to express a wider range of emotions? In well, general. You know, it's interesting you mentioned about a wider range of emotions yes. because there's a great analogy, you know, with like a pendulum. Uh -huh. And, you know, you can imagine something hanging here and swinging side to side and you have the range of emotions. You have this side, which is like, you know, we'll call them the negative emotions. Mm -hmm. But, you know, anger, frustration, um, disappointment, resentment, sadness, yeah. resentment, all these things. Then this side is all the positive, uh, positive stuff, happiness, joy, love. Now, the thing with the pendulum is if you're only swinging on the negative side a little bit, right? If you're only experiencing your emotion that much, then it's only going to swing that much mm. on this side. So you're kind of having this like very like restrictive amount of range of emotion. So for me, when I realized, I was like, wow, I don't allow myself to feel like anger or I don't allow myself to feel sadness. Mm. I don't allow myself to like to swing and fully experience this emotion over here so then I can fully experience these emotions too. Doesn't mean to stay there, right? You're not gonna like live in that emotion. Acknowledge it, feel it fully and swing it and then fully experience that full range of emotion. And I realized for the longest time, for years, I was living in this, mm. this emotion. So I felt good, I felt happy. I was like, yeah, things good, all right. <laughs> and, but what I didn't realize is that I had a lot of like f emotions that I never really allowed myself to feel mm. and to 
acknowledge. And there's a great sort of analogy for that where it's like, you know, emotions are there to give you messages. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you're in a room and an emotion comes to the door and you're like, no, 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 and you lock the door. And then another emotion comes like, no, 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 you move the couch against the door. You're like, no. And another emotion comes in, you're like, no, too much. I'm, I'm good. Everything's good. Everything's good. Everything's good. And eventually all these emotions are just there. Like, hey, man, we got, we have something to tell you. We need to tell you something. And then eventually you open that door and all those emotions come flooding in at once mm. and you go through this insane experience. And you're just like, it's confusing. It's loud. It's, it's hard to unravel. Yes. And so now I, I try to practice, you know, if I feel something, if an emotion comes, I'm like, I open the door. I'm like, hi, how are you? <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. What's up? What are you... What message are you here to bring me? All right, thank you very much, thank you. And then they're like, cool, and they're on their way. Right, you don't have to hold on to the emotion. You don't have to lock the door with the emotion inside. No, <laughs> no. You can let it in and then let it out the back door. Absolutely, <laughs> and, and you know, there's a great expression, you know, whatever you, re whatever you resist persists. Mm -hmm. You know, we've heard that before and it's, it's so true. You, when you resist things, they're just gonna keep persisting until you eventually acknowledge it. Mm -hmm. and, and then you can decide what you wanna do with that. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, man, it's uh, it's it's been an interesting journey because for me, I always looked at people who were would get angry or get like as weak, and mm -hmm. you know, I'm like, oh, that person, they don't, they can't control themselves or something. Right. And the truth is that, at least for me, in a healthy way, yes, yeah, you know, there's a healthy way, of course, of expressing that feeling. And for me, it's like I, I'll go box or I'll hit something, I'll go connect with something. But I'll just allow myself and I judge myself or shame myself for feeling a certain way. And I've really noticed that when I allow myself to feel that way and accept it, then it dissipates yes. very, very quickly. Yeah, it goes away. Very quickly. That's beautiful, man. And it's, um, I'm curious, what do you think is the, the thing that drove you to accomplishing so much from your childhood, the thing that drove you to accomplishing so much, and then also what was the thing that held you back from experiencing deeper amounts of love? Hmm. So the thing that drove you and then the thing that made you feel maybe trapped or locked inside where you didn't allow yourself to feel the depth of love for yourself or from other people or whatever it might be. Yeah, I think something that might have driven me, you know, when I was younger, I, I went to you know, a few different schools and I would get bullied severely, mm -hmm. get beaten up. And, you know, my neighborhood, I had um, uh, these neighbors and they would like hang me up in a tree by my feet. No, what? Upside and down? Upside down, yeah, by my feet for hours. And what? spit spit on me. No way. They put a gun to my head, telling them they were going to kill me. Like, a real gun? Real gun. Yeah, real gun, because they, they hunted and stuff. So they'd How have old were you? I was about six years old. Holy and cow. They hung you upside down. Yeah, and sometimes like they would actually like hog tie me. They would like tie my, my oh wrists, my, gosh, my ankles together behind my back, on my feet, and then leave me in a field. And I'll never forget, I remember there'd be like an anthill there and I was just like trying to move away from the anthill because I didn't want to get ants all over me. So it was... Holy cow. And so even as I say that now, I kind of say it like this. Right. Not really sort of really saying it into the magnitude of really how bad that was. Yeah, right. Man, that's intense. And for me, you know, growing up, and, and, and thinking about that and carrying that with me, I had a lot of like fear. I was a scared kid. I mean, I went to bed till I was like eight years old mm -hmm. and it makes sense because yeah. I was just living in fear constantly. And um, going and being from a fearful kid and then being like beaten up at different schools. I went to six different schools in a very short amount of time. Um, Cause I just, every time I would just get picked on and I'd get beaten up. Um, and then once I found dance, I was like, oh, this place feels like I belong here. And I love the music. And then my teacher, Rick Robinson, who was the most incredible guy, is from Chicago, lived in Provo, Utah. And he brought me in. He was like, yo, Heavy D, you know, come on in here, man. And I was like, oh, he gave me a nickname. Well, that's cool. Heavy you D, know? yeah. And taught me about dance, taught me about life, you know, all these different things. And then I had the opportunity to move to England when I was 12 mm. years old by mm. myself. Wow. So going from a really scared kid, afraid of his shadow, afraid of the dark, couldn't sleep over at somebody's house because mm. I would wet the bed, you know. Um, and then get picked on and made fun of. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I would 
Then I moved to England by myself at 12 years old. That's nuts. So it was it was like one extreme to the absolute next extreme, but I grew up real fast, and I suddenly became unafraid. Wow. And uh, part part of the part of the what I was why I was saying that was because, you know, when you look back at the time and I think about those kids who would do that to me, um, there should be a lot of anger there, right? There should be a lot of like resentment there. Um, however, through the time of experiencing that and understanding and being curious, right? Because that's also something I always also say as well is like we got to stay curious. Mm -hmm. Stay curious with people, yes. especially in this climate with like politics or yes. cancel culture and everything. Cancel culture, yeah. like be curious. Why did that person do that? What, what, why do they believe that? Like why? And so for me, when I look back at those kids, like I have empathy. Like I actually have compassion for them. Mm -hmm. Like wow, man, they must have been going through some stuff. So it's like they had to do that to that little boy. Yeah. Um, wow. But I can also be angry about it for that little boy. Of course. You know, on behalf of him. But not hold it, you know what I mean? Just feel it for him, honor mm -hmm. it, and then let it go. Uh, but uh, I can't remember what the original question was, but I just kind of was going that, off a tangent. The but, thing that drove you oh. to become successful and accomplishing so much, mm -hmm. and then the thing that, yeah, so what was? Well, part of that drive, I think, was me wanting to get out of there. Yeah. I was, I was like, let me get out of here. And once I was in England, um, I just felt this desire to just become better and, mm. and and I didn't do it because I wanted to prove anybody wrong. Really? I didn't do it because I wanted to like, that wasn't really my motivation. It was, truly I think my motivation was going back to what I said before, where I really felt like in order to receive love, I had to be good. Mm -hmm. In order to receive love, I had to feel like I accomplished something and I was worthy of it. Yeah. Not just for being myself. Um, but yeah, and that was good. And that was good. That was a good drive yeah, yeah, for a while, yeah. but it, it wasn't sustainable. Right. It wasn't sustainable. And what was the thing that held you back from feeling a deep sense of love? A deep sense of love. For yourself and receiving love for just existing. Yeah. Um, what held me back? Uh, I think it's just the, those, that's that belief system. Mm -hmm. That belief system and feeling like, you know, um, yeah, kind of the same thing. I think I just really? I, I was just holding on to that 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 feeling of I'm not good enough. Like just me as I am is not enough. I have to accomplish something. I had terrible acne, all these things. So I I would lock myself in a room and learn how to play drums because I was like, nobody's gonna love me if I'm not talented. If I'm not talented, dude, nobody's gonna love me unless That's I like crazy. unless I have a skill. Because I like look at my face. Like if I smile, like you know, right. stuff comes out. Like it's yeah. awful. <laughs> yeah, dude, I remember those years. Yeah. So it was, it was a lot of insecurity, a lot of fear of it not being enough, which I'm sure everybody experiences. Yes. Um, and, but that definitely drew, drove me a lot, a lot. And I've, I had a lot of encouragement from people, but you know, we talk about that sort of, we talk about like bad people, right? And you, you know, and I talk about being curious about other people. Um, one thing that really stuck out with me that I heard that made me so curious about just human beings and the human condition is, you know, there's that whole word out there like evil people or bad people and it's just like, well, that's just what it is. You're bad mm -hmm. and that's it. And what I heard is like, you know, they're not bad people trying to be good. It's like they're wounded people trying to heal. Because mm. I, I really truly believe that people aren't innately bad, right? I think that I look at people and I think like they were once a young boy, they were once a young girl. Something happened along the way that created, you know, this, these behaviors yeah. or these things that have happened, and that those are wounds. Those experiences that they've experienced are wounds. And I'm not saying that what they've done, you know, things have happened. Things have happened to me, and it's not okay that they've done that, by any means. Yeah. But it doesn't mean that I can't look at them and go, they're wounded. That's a wounded person, and I, I hope that they can heal through that. You know. What's the, uh, how did you learn to heal the different parts of your life? And what's the, the experience that you've, that was the hardest to learn how to heal? To heal, I mean, acknowledging it first and foremost, you uh -huh. have to just 
realize that it's uh, the pain or the hurt or the upset or the thing that happened. Yeah, and, and acknowledging and, it and do some detective work too, oh. because sometimes what you think it is isn't actually what it is. Right. You might think, oh, I'm really upset about this, but then when you actually start asking yourself more questions and digging a little deeper, you're like, actually, that's actually not what's upsetting me. It's something that happened even before that. Hmm. You know, where actually, did I feel a little abandoned? Did I feel a little bit of a abandonment? Even though I went to England and I, and I cherished that, and I'm like, thank God I had that experience and it took me on this course. But maybe a part of me felt like that wasn't wanted. And I never felt like that consciously. Right. But as I like dug deeper, I was like, huh. wait, that's, that's in there. Interesting. Maybe I didn't, I, I didn't feel wanted actually subconsciously. And maybe that's what kind of drove me. That I had to be. You wanted to get away to be good, yeah. so I could be wanted. Ooh, you know. So it's interesting. Sometimes the thing that you think it is isn't really yeah. what it is. Yeah. And you keep digging, and you're like, "Oh, wow! I didn't even think of that." And isn't it interesting when you started to have all the skills and accomplish all the success, you still didn't feel like you were. Maybe you felt wanted, like on the surface or at a certain period of time, but you didn't personally feel wanted. Yeah, like yeah. with yourself. No, and like and, it's still not good enough. And no, I never like really truly happy with yourself, you know. And again, that's good. F- it was good fuel, right? F- to a certain extent, you know. Uh-huh. But again, not sustainable. You can't sustain that, you know. You have to you not just accept yourself, but like you love yourself. And it's mm. so cliche, of course. We hear all those things are Hallmark cards, uh-huh. and you hear those things, and they go in one ear out the other because you hear them so often. And that's why I tell people, it's like usually when you hear like a. Like, like believe in yourself or like <laughs> love yourself. Don't, don't just be like, oh yeah, we've heard that before. Yeah. There's a reason why we hear that so much. There's a reason why you hear it everywhere. Mm-hmm. And every show, every movie, every postcard, every, it's because it's so important. When did you feel like you, oh, go ahead. No, I was just gonna say it's so important. It and then to look into that, not as just a slogan, but as like, like really look into that. What does yes. that mean for you? For yourself. When did you feel like, what age did you feel like you started to really love yourself? Not for the accomplishments, not for the skills, not for the talent or what you've done, but for who you are being. Um, They're like, yesterday, still, yesterday. Still working on it, man. <laughs> not, not still, still, yeah, still, still working on it, man. I think that's the thing is like there's days when you feel, or moments, I should say, that not really mm. days, not prolonged times for me. I feel like now mm. I don't let myself dwell in sort of, um, self-pity if you will or or like mm-hmm. what was me but there's definitely moments uh where that ego comes in and that voice that roommate comes in your head and is like hey you're you're a phony you're a fraud mm-hmm. like you're 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 not this you're not that and you're seeing all these things and you're like oh yeah you're right and you start listening to them and it's the the great book uh untethered soul mm-hmm. um we talked about that the roommate in your head and if you had a roommate in your house who was telling you, yo, you're a piece, like you're useless, you're a you loser, suck. you yeah. suck, you'd be like, hey, you need to get out here, <laughs> you need to go. But for some reason we allow this roommate to you know, live rent free in our head and, mm-hmm. and sit there and call the shots and say things. So I think it's just being aware of that. But yeah. So still, st- still practice, still learning. But I think that at least for me, I started to accept myself a little bit more and love myself more. Mm-hmm when I was being a little bit more congruent with myself too. Because I also realized that I would say certain things, you know, to people, because I'm, I'm coaching them, right? I would be right. like teaching them on Dancing with the Stars and I'm teaching them like, hey, we need to work on this, do this, and you need to believe this. And, and then I would go home and I was like, I wasn't living that. Wow. I wasn't being what I was preaching, essentially, what I was teaching. Yes. And I hated myself for that. Really? I hated myself for that because I was like, I'm a fake, I'm a phony, I'm a fraud. I'm not being congruent with what I know what is right or what I know Mm. is going to be helpful. So by being congruent fully, when when I say something, I live it. Mm. Then I'm like, then I I can love myself. That's true. I, I really love myself because, yeah, there's no sense of like, Feeling phony, if that makes sense. Right, you know? right. Yeah. What's the thing you're most proud of that you've either overcome or embraced in the last couple of years, since the kind of since the pandemic? Yeah. Like a lot of people have uncovered things in their life, 
uh, some people on health or relationships or finances or their career paths. What's the thing that you're most proud of that maybe people don't even know about that you've, um, that you've overcome? That I've overcome? Um, I mean, or are overcoming a, still. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, no, there's, there's, there's been lots of things. I think, you know, um, I think, you know, when we, we, I'm trying to think about that actually, just like, uh, you know, it's interesting, the pandemic taught me a few things. I'm sure it's taught many people, you know, a lot of things. Um, for me, it was being an overachiever that I am, it was a good moment for me to like pause, pause yeah. and be okay with not doing a, a whole lot, you know, and enjoying watering the plants. So. <laughs> You know, and, becoming a TikTok star. Yeah. <laughs> Which, by the way, that's been a whole other animal, man. Yeah, it's, man. It's just like that was another thing too. I, for me, I was like, all right, I take myself seriously, but I also don't take myself too seriously. Yeah. And I think that was a good, be a that's, goofball. It's a yeah. good outlet to just be my inner dork. Yeah. You know, we talk about our emotional home. You know, where's your emotional home? Like, my emotional home is dork. Like yeah. that's, that's, that's where I live. Um, but I think as well. Something that I feel like I've overcome that's been, uh, I think, letting go. Mm. Letting go. Just the art of letting go. Letting go, you know, and, and realizing that you not only can't control other people, mm -hmm. you c cannot control your environment, but you certainly can control the meaning. Mm. You certainly can control, you know, what it means to you and, how, and what, what are you going to do with that. You're in full control of that. And there's been a lot of situations where there's had to been some, a lot of forgiveness, you know, from others or for myself or a lot of letting go, letting go um, of, you know, certain th things not working out. Um, mm -hmm. And just- Expectations that weren't met. Yeah, and just um. being like, and just being like, hey, this is, it's the isness, like this is what is. and. And then when you realize that there's like this beautiful release that happens. Um, but it is, but it, like again, it's like, it's never like a magic pill and everything just like mm -hmm. happens and everything clicks and you're good to go. It's in daily practice. Yes. You know, you know, it's, uh, it's the, the physical fitness, it's the emotional fitness, it's the mental fitness. You know, it's, you have to do it every day. And I know, I, I'm sure you do too. Like mm -hmm. I know like when I haven't been working my emotional fitness yeah. or my mental fitness, I, things start creeping in. I'm knocking the face, man. Yeah, yeah. You're like, oh man, I was not ready for that. Yeah, yeah. I wasn't ready. Uh, <laughs> and you're like, wow, I haven't been like lifting, lifting my emotional weights yeah. essentially, and um, it bites you sometimes. It you know, does. so it reminds you, you got to, you know, be consistent. Mm -hmm. You know, letting the good things come in your mind. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, man, I just feel like uh, going back to the healing. I just think that like, when we look at certain wounds in ourselves and look at wounds in others, I really feel like that when you heal your wounds, you heal the world. Mm. You know, because I think that's really what all this trauma is and that it, what we're feeling in this world is like, there's just, there's wounds. And we just need to, you know. Absolutely, if we're not willing to heal the things that are hurting us, we're gonna be taking that out on other people, whether that's actually reacting in situations where we don't need to react, whether that's holding back our love for other people or our generosity and our gifts. Yeah. Whatever it is, it's hurting other people by us not being our full, authentic, healed selves. Yeah. And that is the that is the work, man. That is it took me a long time to learn how to heal. Until I turned about 30, I actually learned how to start healing certain things. Mm -hmm. And I'm like every couple of years, there's new things that come up where I'm like, oh, I've got to learn how to heal this. And I yeah. thought I was done, but it's like you're constantly learning. Mm -hmm. But if we don't learn the art of healing consistently, then man, we're holding back something from the world. Yeah. And I think the, the, the whole prospect of healing is something that's, you know, the difference between guilt and shame, right? Like guilt is, you know, I did something bad and shame is I am bad. Mm -hmm. And your identity. And that's yeah. so, you know, terrible. So I feel like it's, Yes. When, we, when there's something wrong with us, or, or sorry, not wrong with us, but when we have a feeling or an emotion, um, we like to sort of uh, look at it as something wrong with us, right? Yes. And, and we don't allow ourselves to heal because we think that's who we are. Instead of looking at it and being like, hey, this is not who I am. This is something I did. Something I did, perhaps, or something that happened to me, mm -hmm. or whatever it is. I don't need to hold on to it. Or yeah. happened for me. Mm -hmm. And 
yeah, I can use that and turn it into something beautiful. You know, these problems that we feel like we have in our lives and look at these, you know, adversities. And I think Tony Robbins says this beautifully, but, you know, um, what if your enemy is your angel? Mm. Yeah. You know, what if your enemy is your angel? When you look at my bullies, you know, back in the day, how are they my angel? Okay, well, they taught me how to have compassion for people, Man. you know, put, you were hanging, up, hanging me up in a tree. How, how is this person, this person who you're like, oh, I cannot stand being around this person. They're just like so annoying or, oh, just, that, that person is your angel teaching you patience. They're in your life to teach you something. Uh-huh. And so looking at certain things in your life as not your enemy, but your angel. I think that sometimes that opens up an amazing door of, empowers you. Absolutely. You know, in a beautiful way. Everything's about the perspective on, on every event or moment that happens. There are so many artists, creatives, actors, dancers, people who work in the arts that struggle. Sure. There's not many that, um, there's not many dancers that make a full-time income. Yeah. Right? You're one of the, I don't know, hundred, you know, that are yeah. making like consistent full-time income in the world probably, sure, right? At the sure. level that you're at. You're probably in the top 10, I'm assuming, in the world of like. Yeah, you definitely don't get, become a dancer to become a millionaire. Exactly. No, no. <laughs> exactly. You don't. But you've learned how to use your creative artistry and also turn it into a business for yourself. You've learned how to earn a living, let's say, and, and multiply it abundantly. Um, but there's a lot of artists out there, sure. whether they be writers or painters or dancers or any type of creative yeah. actors that struggle. Sure. They struggle to get gigs, they struggle mm-hmm. to get their work be seen yeah. and even just talked about, not even purchased, but just talked about. They mm-hmm. struggle to, again, book stuff, what would you say to all the artists in general out there, whether they're a dancer or just a creative individual that wants to express their art in a certain way, who is struggling to get noticed, seen, mm-hmm. booked, paid for their talent? What would you say would be the, the process or the roadmap from going to making nothing to little mm-hmm. to making a full-time living? Well, I think we live in a, an amazing time right now yes. for artists. Absolutely. Look because, at TikTok. Man. Oh my gosh. Instagram, TikTok. Well, Instagram, TikTok, YouTube. I mean, there's there's creators out there who are making millions of dollars. Um, and and here's here's the thing. I, we were just talking about this the other day. Yeah. And I was talking to a friend of mine. And um, I said, you know when you get like a reel, like a sizzle reel? Uh-huh. You know, choreographers, casting directors, things like that. They, they might look at it, but then they immediately go to your Instagram page. They do, don't they? Immediately. I know I do. Uh, you know, I was casting for my Vegas show, and I was like, wait, who's this kid? Oh, let me go check his Instagram. And I'm looking at his Instagram. And the way I look at it, and the way they, you know, um, perception. think of dancers, yeah. it's a real time reel. It's a real time. So it's like, what are, what are, they, what are they doing now? Like, Today, what's going on right now? Yesterday, yeah. this week. I don't want to see your past 10 years no. of whatever. Like, what's happening like last week? Let me see where you're at. And, and, and that's, that's incredibly helpful. And that's kind of where things have been going. So I would say stay up to date. Don't wait for somebody to give you an opportunity. Mm-hmm. Create your opportunities. You, you have the platforms to do that now. You really do. You truly do. If you're not sure about something, University of YouTube. <laughs> you know what that's I mean? Same YouTube. I mean, my girlfriend and I, she taught herself how to do Premiere Pro last year. It's crazy. Edit everything. Um, and I see that a lot. I see a lot of people kind of like, well, you know, I just, I must not get in these jobs. And I'm like, I'm like, well, what are you doing? Like, well, what do you mean? I'm like, well, are you putting content out there, you know, weekly or once a month or something, whatever it is. Um, and I think that you just got to stay on top of it. And also don't ever, just never lose the love for it as well. Yeah. Cause I know for me, I got burned out of it, the love of it, because I forgot why I did it in the first place. Mm. And I did it because I was dancing in my living room with my family and I just remember it just bringing me joy and I love the music and I love the way it made me feel. I think that's part of, partially why too on TikTok I'm kind of a goofball because I'm kind of staying in touch with that sort of inner dork, that inner kid where I'm like, hey, I don't have to take myself too seriously. I can have fun and I can be serious and I can be deep mm. and I can be emotional and I can be a leader and I can be a coach and I can be a performer. I, there's, no, there's no limits anymore where you're like, you're a dancer and that's it. 
I mean, you, you, we live in a time where you can be whatever you really want to be mm-hmm. and you can create your own audiences and that's what's so special. I think it's really hard to make a full-time living without creating some type of consistent content as an artist these days. If yeah. you're not using the platforms to create and showcase in a unique way for the platforms, it's hard to just be talented and someone just discover you. Yeah. Without you putting stuff out there, it's really hard. You right? know, it's... um. That's the problem too, I realized, it's execution. Yeah, yeah. Execution is everything. Mm-hmm. Again, you know, ideas are a dime a dozen. Everybody has mm-hmm. ideas. That's Everybody cool. has like these like, oh, wouldn't this be cool? And then you see this guy over here execute something that's not even as good, but it's getting just blowing up. Mm-hmm. And you're like, oh man, like I can't, that, they're not even that good. But you're like, but they executed. They actually saw the idea, they saw it through, they put it on tape, they made it happen, and it's out there. Whereas your idea is dying in your mind, sitting there. So keep it simple, you know, complexity is the enemy of execution. Yes. And something that I do as well is I book a date, I book a date before I have an idea. I go, okay, it's, I need a, it's time to create something. And I just go, all right, I'm gonna pay for her. Uh, a space, I pay for a camera, I pay really? for this, and I pay it. So now I'm invested. Without knowing what the thing is going to be. Don't even know what it's going to be. Yet. Interesting. I invest in it. That way I'm like, now I have the pressure. Now I have to do it. You know, I don't have, let's like, I'll do it when I'm ready. No. You know, because you're never really ready, truly, no, right? Never. never ready. And that was something I learned from my coaches. I would have a few hours rehearsal and then compete that weekend, and I'm like, we're a mess. They're like, the biggest work. the biggest learning curve is on the floor. Wow. You, you could rehearse for months, but you're never going to learn the biggest lesson, which is like being in the ring or being yes. on the floor. You have to have that experience. So and the more you do it on the floor in front of people, yeah. the, the faster you're going to learn and the better you're going to become more confident it's, in everything. It's, 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 you know, it's yeah. incredible. And like immersion, you know, immersion is huge, massive. I mean, you know, you want to be a good guitar player, you know, you say, oh, I'm going to take a an hour lesson, you know, a week. Mm-hmm. It's gonna take you years to be a good guitar player. <laughs> Every day. Yeah, well Dance with the Star is a good example. You know, people are like, wow, they get so good so fast. It's like four or five hours a day, right? And seven days a week for That's three it. months. Like, of, the, hopefully they get better. I mean, it's, you know, it's hard for some other <laughs> people. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, it's that immersion. If you really wanna do something, there's absolutely nothing holding you back. Who are some examples you saw in the last year who were like, blew up there were nobodies that were creatives whether it be artists or dancers or singers that you saw that blew up and actually you know have an audience and are making a full-time income now do you have a few examples um i don't even some of them i don't even know their names right. honestly probably uh properly but um because i just kind of follow them uh-huh. but i've seen them go from like you know hundred thousand to now like four and then you see you know they're doing deals and brand deals yes. and doing things and you're just, and for me, it makes me so happy because I'm like, wow, that didn't exist two years ago. No. That opportunity didn't exist. That person might not have had the opportunity to, to even do that. And, and I, you know, and I hear a lot of people be bitter about that. They're like, yeah. like oh, I can't believe that. And I'm always like. They executed. They executed, man. They took action consistently. And something you said a few minutes ago was about some of your most viral content was shot on an iPhone that wasn't produced. No. That was like last minute, let's just shoot this thing real quick and, yeah. and put it out there. It was you being your dorkiest self, sure. not your most like professional Polished. dressed like in a suit, yeah. you know, production, <laughs> choreographed for months. It's you just been like, yeah. oh my God, we, you know. Yeah, 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 exactly. exactly. Which by the way, which, which oh is, we oh got we, we got we. Oh, no, but that's what's funny about that is that it, and listen, sometimes that hurts because like, yeah, you put like, all oh. your heart and soul into something and you're like, <laughs> oh, two views, nobody yeah. saw that. But the way I look at it is I do a lot of those and those are like for me. Yeah. Right? The quality. Yeah, like, of course. The, like the content that I look at, I'm like, ooh, that was beautiful. And if like 10 people see it, so it's be like it. like the rain falling down on you and the lights yeah. and ah, yeah. you know, yeah. <laughs> So be Tap it. Tap dancing on buildings and ah. Yeah, know. exactly. And that, because that, that, those like dreams you had, like yeah. I love to do that and then and you, by the way, even if nobody saw that, the amount of pride that you feel yes. for just seeing it through yeah. is, you know, that momentum carries you through mm-hmm. to the next thing. Mm-hmm. 
but you're right. There's some things where I'm like, I do something re- really silly, dorky, and it blows up, and um, and you're like, and then it's funny because then I'll, I was at the Candy Honors recently with Dick Van Dyke and Garth Brooks and the legends, you know, and and uh, <laughs> ten people come up to me like, hey, you're that TikTok guy, right? I'm like, yeah, 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 yeah. I am. and it, that doesn't bother me. People are like, does that bother you? I'm like, absolutely not, because it's just a new audience, it's yeah. new people, and. And it's kind of fun because then you get to surprise them. Look what I can really do. Which is like, check this out, you know? Yeah. So it's, it's pretty cool. That's amazing, man. Um, what do you think is going to happen over the next two to four years for artists, creatives, and you know, singers, dancers? What do you think is possible? I mean, that's really anything is possible, you know, yeah. really. Um, and that's very vague and very general to yeah. say. Um, but we've seen it. We've seen, you know, it's, it's been disrupted. You know, the whole industry has been disrupted. Mm-hmm. You know, the power is in the artist's hands now where they can do live streaming shows yeah, man. and make a ton of money, which is something they never had before. You know, you had to be physically on a show, on stage, doing something. Um, and it's just going to continue to innovate, you know, continue to, to, to branch out. You know, I have some fun ideas. And actually, it's interesting. A lot of creative ideas that I had or I have I've actually come from TikTok really? um, where I reach out to them and say, hey, I love what you're doing. I have this project I'm doing on television coming up and I really would love to use your talent for this project. That's cool. There's something coming so you're finding up. talent online. Oh my gosh. And booking talent for your stuff. Because that's the thing too. I think sometimes people think that it's just like whatever, but there's some legit like people on there that are really good at what they do, top of what they do. Yeah. And um, there's some projects next year, early in the year, before the Oscars, leading up to the Oscars, that I'm working on right now, and it's uh, I'm really excited about it because it's something I've played with for Ooh. a long time, but the technology has never been there, and now the technology is there. So that's exciting. It's pretty exciting. How important is uh, artists not competing against each other but collaborating with each other? It's become a collab universe now. Yeah, it's all about collab. Because you were all about competition growing up. Yeah. Dance with Star. No, I'm gonna oh. win. I'm not gonna tell you my secrets. We're gonna be the best. Yeah, you never collaborated. You were like, especially in the ballroom world, you know, yeah. competing. It was just like out for blood and barely spoke to people. At least yeah. for me, I was. Yeah, <laughs> I just. I was like. You're an, yeah. I was. Yeah, I was very competitive. But no, now I love collaborating because I see you do collabs all the time now. Love. I love learning. Like yeah. you know, I mean, you know, just a forever student. You know, I think uh, whenever I see something and I'm like, man, I love to tap. Or I love to do this. And well, I saw that like that drum thing, and I think for me, it's wildly inspiring to to work with somebody that has talented skills that I don't have, and I'm just like in awe of them, you know. And I think that that's the thing for me is I I always want to live in a state of awe mm. in everything when traveling and people, and just I never want to lose that like wow, yeah. you know, that feeling, yeah. that hunger. Um, because I think that we, we've all been there, I'm sure, where we lose that hunger, that mm-hmm. drive. Yeah, man. And you're like, what are we doing? What are we doing? <laughs> yeah. What are we doing? Like, what's... So to remind ourselves, and I think that a lot of times bringing pe- fresh people in with new That's perspectives good. and ideas revitalizes that hunger, mm-hmm. and, you know, so. What's your process for, you were just mentioning about visualizing something in the future, you wanted to create and choreograph. You've had these ideas, but now the technology is there. I'm curious, what's your visualization process in general for projects, competing, wanting to land uh, a judging spot for a big TV show? Like, how do you visualize and manifest and attract so much? Is there a method, a process? Is it just, I you're, think just you're good looking and things come to you? Like, what's, <laughs> what, uh, you know, what is that? I think, I think for me, when I look back at certain opportunities, and I, it's a good example, um, during the quarantine. Yeah how certain things manifested. In quarantine, I, everything shut down. No uh-huh. entertainment, no shows. My tour, you know, the Vegas show was canceled. Everything's, you know, on the back burner. And we're at home, we're chilling out. And I say that my girlfriend, Haley, I was like, I was like, babe, I was like, let's, let's do something. Like, let's dance. Like, let's just dance around the house. Let's just dance around the house. I'll jump up on here, we'll spin around, I'll do a dip, we'll edit it on the thing. We'll learn how to edit on the computer. And, Anyways, we put it up there, and then from that, 
you know, these guys named Nick and RJ who do Pink's tour and they do multiple television shows, they do everything. They saw that and they were about to work on a project called the Disney Sing Along. And they were like, oh, that would be perfect for this. So they called me up, said, hey, we saw this video. We would love for you to do something like that for this. So I'm like, great. So we did that. So you booked a gig at home. Booked a gig to do for that. Disney. And then we're, we're, we edited the whole thing ourselves. I saw it was we an amazing video, it. yeah. Michael Bublé is calling me. He's like, bro, that was, I love that. It was so great. Wow. Like, we need to work together. I love you so much. And I was like, I, Bublé? I, I love you, Bublé. Yeah, he's amazing. He's the best. Oh, I directed a music video for him like oh, years ago. Sick. And we've kind of had this like little bromance from afar. Right. Still haven't met in person. What? No, it's this crazy. This guy's unbelievable. I love it. Dude, Christmas time is a, my favorite because of him. Because of him. Oh, he's, he's incredible. He's legend. And he's, by the way, he's the he's a better person than he is really? even a singer. He's Canadian, right? Or, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm like, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> he's just a nice guy. But then from that, it was just like opportunity from opportunity. And it just kind of, there was so many more that came from that. Uh, and now like an Emmy Award, possibly, a for nomination. That. For, for one of those performances. The Disney choreographer or That one else. that led to the Christmas one, that led to this, and then now judging on Dancing with the Stars, and then, so my point being was, you know, it, it's, you, you just, if you have an idea, like go with it. Don't worry about it, like yeah. it's perfect or polished. You start where you stand and, and go with it, because you don't know where it's gonna lead to you. And, yeah. and almost everything I have in my life that I look at, it's because of, me saying yes to so many things. Mm -hmm. You know, the small gig over here, I'd be like, yeah, okay, let's do it. Yeah. Doesn't pay anything, but I'm gonna do it. And then there was somebody there who saw that, who does over here and, so yeah, so I, I would just say, start, say yes more. Uh -huh. Say yes more, yeah. and, to, to, and to yourself. Absolutely. Yeah. What's your thoughts on the law of attraction? Is this something that you study or implement in your life, or is it more of just you have an idea, you create it, and I think that it's, I think that, uh, yeah, I think, I think what, what you focus on is what you feel, mm -hmm. right? And what you focus on, what you feel, and what you feel, I think that is what you manifest. Mm -hmm. um, and I've noticed that at least for mm. me, if I'm a little bit more optimistic and a little bit more, and I see the light and I see the opportunities, um, they, they, I, I, I see them more, does that make sense, mm. right? I'm aware of them, I'm, I'm turning on that like, I'm looking for them, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like I'm, I have my like uh, filter on of the possibilities versus, you know, if you're looking, you know, if you're cynical and you're like, oh, it's just nothing going on, I just. You're gonna feel that way. And yeah. Then you're not gonna attract. Well, you're just, well also you're just gonna see what's wrong, mm -hmm. right? You're just gonna see what's wrong. You're gonna, you're gonna see how this opportunity is not gonna work gonna see how this idea you had isn't gonna work, you know, and go to quote Tony Robbins again, my guy, you know, he's one of my biggest mentors since I was 15 years old and, you know, it's about that state. And I really feel like that actually. I went to a seminar of his when I was 15 years old. Me too. In Cardiff, Wales. I was 16, I was 16 when I went. Really, we, yes. would you go, would you come here? He was in St. Louis, Missouri when I was there at that time, yeah. Dude, and but first of all, we're like, being 15, 16 years yeah. old, we're like, it was amazing, dude. Unbelievable. It was crazy. It shifted my life in a, in a sense. I don't know if it's dramatic, but it was like, I don't know what type of event it was for you. For me, he was doing this tour in the USA that was like this kind of success principles event where he brought in a lot of other speakers. Like, yeah. It was, yeah, Larry King was there and Donald Trump, and it was like all these different like coaching, right. NFL, Super Bowl coaches, and you know, actors. But he came down on stage one time. I was maybe you know, it was an arena and I was in like the middle court, if it was a basketball court, and he came down yeah. and kind of stopped right in front of me. He was like. And I was like, is this God? You know, it's like. Oh, this, actually, actually like sorry, you, you were probably like. I was sitting down and he was like, <laughs> yeah, no, I was sitting down. <laughs> yeah. But I remember him being like hovering over me with this powerful energy. And I can't remember what he said, but I remember the way it made me feel. Mm -hmm. And I was just like, I want to be able to create that for other people when yeah. I grow when I grow up, you know, I want to be able to do that for other people. But so when he went to the, to Cardiff, and you were at the event. What did you experience? Well, that's it was. It was that. It was just wow. like that energy that's being you know shown, and and also too is the tools too. The state, just controlling your state. Yes. That that was a game changer for me because being a competitor, you know, um, and this is actually what happened to me. I went to the seminar. I'm buzzing. You know, you're like, uh -huh. wow, I could do anything. Wow. And then my partner at the time dumped me. Oh. And she was like the best in the world. She was like the one that everybody wanted to dance with. Like she was like the 15-year-old. The 15 year the old. gem. 
Yeah. She was 15. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, we were like yeah, yeah. in our little ballroom ladder yeah, world. Yeah. And uh, she dumped me and I'm like, uh. But because I was so pumped, I was like, let's go. Well, who's next? Who's like, who I gotta find? And I ended up dancing with this girl who got dumped by her partner. <laughs> so we were like the dumps. Like we were like the rejects. <laughs> right. And, and they were the super team. Really? They got together. Oh, they got together. Yeah. And, but... You, I, beat, you beat them, didn't you? We did. We, Let's go, we baby. Beat them. We like we went to the Royal Albert Hall in London, and this like arena, like wow. like, a, like a bullfighting ring, and we we ended up beating him. But so that was kind of a cool moment. But what I realized, and I kind of forgot about that whole seminar and the whole thing. But my whole life, it was ingrained in me yeah. the state thing. Yes, changing your state, just like your physiology, the language, your focus, that stuck with me for so many years. And when I look back at all my world championships or my competitions that I did and when I was on stage in London doing eight shows a week and I like was sick but I had to go on there you know I was I would do that I would I would get myself in state and I would get myself in a place where I was like I would deliver every time and wow. and I think that that really honestly really helped me throughout my life and I look at opportunities dancing with the stars and they call me and say hey can you do this thing and I'm like yeah I don't know how to teach I had really? a, I how was, were you I was 22, 22. But I was like, I was faking it big time. I don't know what I was doing. I was like, yeah, I think you. I knew how, I knew how to dance, but didn't right. teaching so hard to teach. Teaching man. is so different, so Dude, different. I, I've been salsa. You seen me salsa dance? I've salsa danced for. I just saw. I just saw your uh, the teacher the other day. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. yeah. She was at me. Yeah. Uh, and I've been salsa dancing, social salsa dancing, not Latin ballroom style, but Listen, social dancing. It's I've a seen you salsa dance, man. It's, it's, a different, pretty, it's a different style. It's pretty amazing. It's a different style. And uh, I'm intimidated actually to be in the ball. Because when I watch ballroom, I'm like, I have no idea what you guys are it's doing. It's very different. It's a very different, different language. Yeah. Anyways, I've been doing it for 16 years. And um, I can't remember what I was going to say now. But it was, it's <laughs> it a, was all, <laughs> listen, all I remember is seeing you at. Um, I think it was like my sister's engagement party. Dancing. And you were dancing with Haley and you all sweating. Dripping sweat, man. And, just, and I remember just being like, <laughs> I had no idea Lewis had this. I know, right? I man? did not know he had this. This I is know, amazing. Man. It's, it's incredible. Uh, you know, but being salsa dancing puts me in that state too. Yeah. It makes you feel like when you move your body, yeah. it puts you in that state. And I think a lot of people don't know how to get there. Probably as a, as a dancer, you know when you move in your body, you get in that flow state. Yeah. You're releasing it. Negative emotions, your oh, heightening your vibration. I think it, well, it's primal, right? I mean, yeah. you look at like your body. It's it's, you know, I always say this. Like you, you know, you look at a toddler, you know, before they can walk, before they can crawl. You put them on the ground. Mm -hmm. You put some music on. What do they do? They're, they're like a little they're worm. Like, like a <laughs> nobody taught them to do that. Nobody yeah. showed them to do that. It's in us. It's primal. Mm -hmm. And then somewhere along the way, you know, we would dance around as a kid, like on the couches and stuff. And somewhere along the way. You know, we just got afraid of it. We got afraid of Gosh. dancing and moving. And, and singing and dancing, we got afraid. Yeah, and when people say this, they say this all the time. Oh, I don't dance. And I'm always like, well, when did you decide that? They're like, what do you mean? I'm like, well, when did you stop dancing? They're like, oh, I never danced. I was like, really? Not mm. even like when you were like a kid? Like, well, yeah, sure, I like, like goofed around. I'm like, well, okay, so what made you stop? And then usually they're like, well, actually there was this one time when like somebody laughed at me or, or somebody said that I wasn't good or, and then boom, they just switch off that part of themselves, oh, and they and they and they stop. They deprive themselves of this like primal thing in us man. that is meant to move, which is why the you know, movement we were meant to move. Yes, and I, it's the best thing to see, especially on Dancing with the Stars. It's one of my favorite things, like working with Amy Purdy. She's amazing. Paralympian. Man. She's amazing. Two prosthetic legs. We're sitting there. We have no idea how to do this. There's no handbook. There's no rule book of how to you know, dance with prosthetic legs. We're making it up. You know, we had to go through, find these swimmer's feet that were pointed, all these different things. And my favorite moment ever was, we, were, we just got done finishing um, rehearsal in this Argentine tango and she sat on a stool and she started to cry. And I, and I was like, oh gosh, what did I say? <laughs> what did I do? I was too hard on her. Like, and she just said like, this is the first time I felt truly feminine since I lost my legs. Oh. And it was so powerful because she just felt like this, like reintroduced mm. to this part of herself that was missing. Mm. And I, and I literally that happened almost every single Gosh. partner where they were like, there was like this like reintroduction, like, oh, hey, remember this person? Wow. Remember, the, remember her? 
You know, Nasty Lucan, same thing. Really? Yeah, we had this amazing connection where I actually asked her, I said, I was like, what's your, what's your real name? Is it Nastia? She goes, no, 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 it's Anastasia. And I was like, oh, wow, that's such a different, I just see you differently, it instantly. It just, and her face softened, her whole demeanor softened. Mm. She's like, Anastasia, I was like, when did you stop being Anastasia? She's like, well, when I started gymnastics. I was like, well, who was the girl before that? Dude, it was wow, the most man. powerful, like, and she just like, it was, it was incredible. It was, so going back to that movement and how yes. important it is and the physiology of our bodies, it's uh, obviously I'm very passionate about it because I'm a dancer, but it's, it's just, it's so helpful. I'll, I'll, I'll speak for, you know, as a, as a guy who grew up in Ohio in the Midwest, it wasn't cool to dance, <laughs> sure. right? And, yeah. and, and Twitch talks about this too, is like it wasn't cool for him to dance in Alabama growing up or whatever. Yeah. Um, and I remember I didn't really dance, I don't think I ever danced in like, middle school or high school. I actually did take a tap dancing class in high school for one semester and I wow. felt like it was amazing. Yeah. But other than that, I wasn't like feel comfortable dancing. Mm. Not like whatever, on social dances with girls or something like that. I was mm -hmm. kind of sat in the corner. And when I was 24, 23, 24, I started to learn salsa and for three months I would go, I used to live above a jazz club. My amazing. brother was a jazz violin, he's a jazz violinist. Wow. The best in the world at jazz violin. He's a freak of what? nature. And I, well, needed I, an, I needed an apartment, and he knew of a person who owned this jazz club. And he was like, oh, there's like an artist loft upstairs. Maybe I can get you up there. So I ended up renting this place for $250 a month. Oh, my gosh. A little studio. And downstairs, they had jazz music. But once a week, they had a live salsa band come out. And all the salseros in Ohio would come once a week. And I would go down, and I would watch and just be like, this is another world. This is amazing. The guys are just... So smooth, the women looking beautiful. And I went down there every week for months and I never would step on the dance floor because mm -hmm. I was so scared, mm -hmm. so intimidated of looking bad, of being made fun of. Like yeah. the fear is crippling for people to try to sing in front of others or dance mm -hmm. or do something like this. And I can, I can have empathy because I know what it felt like. And then finally, I was just like, I need to do this. Someone grabbed me on the dance floor, I was resisting it. I made a, I felt like I was making the biggest fool of myself trying to learn the basic steps. Right, right. Stepping on this girl, yeah. just like bumping into people. <laughs> I was like, oh, I'm just this like giant white guy in the middle yeah. of like the <laughs> sea of incredible dancers and everyone's got to laugh at me. This is like the self-talk. Yeah. And then after like five minutes, I, I look around and no one cares. Yeah. No one's looking at me, no one cares. No one cares. And even if they did, who cares? Yeah. Even if they laughed at me, who yeah. cares? Yeah. And I went all in from that moment. I love Obsessing that. over salsa dancing. Every day practicing, dude. Seeing your videos when you're, I'm so yeah. impressed because <laughs> here, here's the thing. Here's what's interesting is that, like social social salsa dancing, yes, it's it's the feel, right? And you're just flowing and you're just kind of Flow. leading, and it's just impro it's improvised. It is. I'm not good at improvising. Really? It's not my dude, forte. I bet you'd be great at it. It's not my forte. Like it's whenever people go, oh, you're come on, dance with me, and they grab <laughs> like, me, and I'm uh, like, well, and it's we need to choreograph like, this. It, I was like, give me give me a couple of hours to like choreograph this routine. <laughs> And they're, I, I'm always like, they're always kind of like slightly disappointed because they're like, <laughs> they're like, oh, he's not as good as I thought he was. But my, because I'm always like, mine is like, mine's very like choreographed yes. and like I have to like, it like work things. It's all about the tech, you know, all that stuff. So I have such admiration for people like, hey, let's go, ba, 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 ba. and they just start dancing, and I'm like, ah, okay, great. Uh -huh. So I love that, dude. I think it's, it's amazing. It's fun, man. But it's, I, and it I is can... liberating, especially for the guys. Dude, it's liberating, and I. And anyone listening or watching, if you haven't experienced yourself dancing in a long time or singing in front of people, one of these expressions, when you tap back into it, like when you were a child, like you were saying, yeah. it's going to bring a whole nother level of energy for you in your life, yeah. in your relationships, in your confidence, and just enjoying life. So yeah. I highly recommend people to get back into it because the first, the first few days doing it is going to be hard, but then it's the freeing. Yeah. It's incredible. My favorite thing is seeing like Super Bowl champions, yes. World Series champions, like come in and come on dance with the stars and they're like, yo, this is insane. Like uh, how do they what do you what this is amazing? And they fall in love with it and they find it so challenging. And uh it's been cool to see like even just from like twelve years ago, you know, people been like, What damn chat pasta what? And now you're in the street and some dude in a football jersey with yeah. a beer is like, yo, I love that pasta doble you did. That really? sachet cake was beautiful. Really? Yeah. 
That's cool. They like their own terminology, and they're like they're so into it because it, it's um they they understand it, they appreciate it more now. So that's exciting. It's been man. cool to see that like massive shift. Yes. In just appreciation of this insane sport and, and artistry, because <laughs> dancers, dancers for me, um, artistic athletes. The greatest athletes in the world are dancers. Artistic athletes. That's that's sort of my that's my phrase for when I look at dancers. So I feel like the the ability to control your body and have freedom and control at the same time. Yeah. As a dancer, it's one of the most inspiring things for me to watch. That's why I love watching you and Haley, your girlfriend, because just in awe of the artistry and the physical talent that Thanks. you guys have. It's like you're incredible athletes. Don't they say dancers are like? Athletes from the gods or something like that. What's the, uh, what's the term? Uh, I know you're something talking. Something like that. I, like, I think Einstein or something. Or something like, yeah. I don't, yeah. It's like the, yeah, it's, uh, the athlete of the gods or something like yeah, that. Yeah, something like that. Anyways, what you were talking about before is um, what you focus on, you feel. And what you feel, you manifest. Can we talk about that a little more? Because I think... There's a lot of people, whether they're an artist or an entrepreneur or just someone that wants to uh, attract the right relationship, and they want to learn how to manifest these things better. And I like the way you you worded it. What you focus on, you start to feel, and what you feel, you manifest. So how do we change our focus, our focus and our feeling so we can start to manifest more quality things in our life as opposed to the negative things? Well, I think, and I'm... I feel like I'm just quoting my man Tony all day here because, I mean, he's my guy. But, um, you know, what's bad is always available, Ooh. but so is what's good. Ooh. It's always available. All, all these things are available for us, right? They're all there. It's just up to us to decide what we decide to focus on. You know, a good expression, actually a good situation is um, Kelly Pickler. I was working with her on Dancing with the Stars, and she had insane nerves. Really? She would just get, we would rehearse and she was great. Shaking. We'd get in a rehearsal and to the, onto the floor, it'd just fall apart because the nerves just got the best of her. And so I said to her, we go back to the state change, and I said to her, I said, I said, this is what I want you to do. I said, don't say that you're nervous. Just say that you're excited. Mm. Because as we know, nervous and excited are chemically identical, right? The body doesn't know the difference. The only difference is our focus, right? Mm. And also our language, what we're saying. Yes. So when we say we're nervous, we're focusing on what's bad. We're like, I'm nervous because I'm going to fall over. I'm nervous because they're not going to like it. I'm nervous because I'm not good enough. Uh, but your body doesn't know it could be excited. So I said, just say you're excited. Just say it. She's like, okay, I'm, I'm excited. I'm like, okay, now just like, say I'm excited. Just fake feel it. it. Yeah, yeah. Just, but just, like, just say it. Don't even feel it. Just fake it. Okay, I'm excited. I'm excited. I'm so excited. And all of a sudden, you could feel like the, all of a sudden her posture changed, her body changed. Mm. Now she was like changing her feeling. She was feeling excited, even though it was the same chemical response. Because mm -hmm. now she's focusing on what's good. Yes. What, what's, I'm excited because I worked hard on this. I'm excited to show these people. I'm excited mm. to you know show what I've been working on. And man, that was the antidote. That was it. We won that season. And we wow. would not, I'm telling you, like we... <laughs> It was crazy. Like all that work would fall apart on the day until we changed that. And that became a ritual of mm, ours. That's cool. Where we were like, I'm excited. I'm excited. And we're focusing yes. on what's good. And so that manifested a good performance. Results. Yeah. Manifested results. So what you focus on is what you feel. So let's focus on like the solutions. Let's focus on the tools that we need in order to achieve what we want, you know. Let's focus on what's good. I mean, social media will hijack you. You oh, know, man. you're just like bad, negative, awful. And then you're like, why do I feel like crap today? You're like, okay, well, because you're focusing on what's bad. And so, yeah, I don't know. I think for me, that's been a, I, don't get me wrong. And there's, I have to catch myself yeah, many, many times. And I still use that to this day for myself. My heart's beating fast. Mm -hmm. My palms are sweating. I'm like, mom spaghetti. Knees <laughs> you know, knees weak, <laughs> arms are heavy. Keep on forgetting what we wrote down. Eminem, please don't say it. So, um, so, how do you prepare then for, you know, you've been on so many big stages. You've been on TV many times. You've been on big stages touring for, I don't know, hundreds of cities over many years. Do you still get nervous before you perform in front of an audience? Yeah. I mean, I get excited now. <laughs> so, how do you prepare? 
an hour before mm -hmm. a big performance, whether you're shooting in front of just cameras and no one's watching, but you know this is for something meaningful, you're on stage in front of thousands of people, yeah. you're on cameras in front of millions of people watching from home, how do you prepare that hour leading up to make sure that you're in your best position to nail it? Yeah, I, it's it's the ritual. Yeah. It's my rituals. It's, uh, you know, everything from stretching, getting my body mm -hmm. right. I have like a heater, you know, I get hot, I sweat. I had to break a full sweat really? before I do anything. Um, and there's something about that that just, I feel like um, it's like my body just kind of awakens when I act, like there's physical perspiration yeah. and I'm sweating. Um, and it's also, again, listening to things, you know, going back to uh, focusing on what's good. You know, I, I'll listen to a podcast, you know, mm -hmm. I'll listen to my man's School of Greatness right yeah, here. You know, I'll put something on that is is nurturing and uplifting and, and nourishing, yeah. I should say. Yeah. Um, and that gets me in the right mindset. The physicality's mm -hmm. there, the focus is there. And it just, and the rest just flows, yeah. you know? And I you think- You put in the preparation and the, and the, the practice so that you just fall yeah. through now, yeah. And, and when it becomes routine, it's reliable. Yeah. You know, I, I know I'll be, I'll be in that spot. I'll be in that place. Really? By doing these things, I know I'll be in that spot by the time it comes to performing or doing what I have to do. And also trusting that it's going to work out. Because I used to drive myself nuts. Really? Like, like it's never going to happen. It's not going to work. I'm a perfectionist. And that was the other thing, too. I used to pride myself on being a perfectionist. I was like, I'm such a perfectionist. And what does perfectionism do to you? Oh, it's paralyzing. Really? Right? Because it's, it's like, because it doesn't exist. It's not real. It's, you're never going to be perfect. And even if it is perfect, you're still going to think there's something's wrong with it, right? Mm -hmm. So you're living in a constant state of disappointment. Constant. Because you're just like, it's never going to be perfect. So realizing that the perfection is the experience. The perfection is that is your heart beating fast. The mm. perfection is you being prepared and giving it, you know, putting in the hours and knowing that you've, that you've done the time. That's the perfection. Like, that's that, that's that feeling. Yeah. It's not actual perfection. You know what I mean? Yes. Um, when did you learn to let go of perfection? Or is it something you Dancing with the stars. Really? Oh my gosh. You had because to. Because it was like, uh, this person doesn't know how to dance. You had uh, to. We gotta go out there and yes. do something. <laughs> no, literally, <laughs> Look, dude. Uh, it was it's crazy. Really bad, but let's go have fun. When I competed before Dance with Stars, I was a terror. Oh, I was wow. honestly a terror. Like, my coaches hated me. <laughs> like, because I was like, Again. It wasn't good enough. Yeah. I was like, ah. Oh. And like, but you won. I'm like, I know I didn't deserve to win. I was wow. like, it was, I was off tonight. And I was so hard on myself. And it just was never good enough. And Dance with Stars rolls around and you're dancing with somebody who's not a dancer. And it <laughs> feels like, it feels like nails on a chalkboard. Oh man. Because in that ballroom dancing, it's all about connection. Yes. It's, it's all about the feeling of it. It's not even like what you're looking at. It's like the feeling. And that takes years to get that like that connection going mm -hmm. with your partner. So that takes thousands of hours. And here you are. You're like, oh, this is. Uh. And man, I had no choice. I had to just like, okay, I this is what it is. Wow. But then I look back on it, and I'm like, and I had to change the definition of what perfection meant to me, which was, the perfection is I get to help this person, I get to serve this person, mm -hmm. I get to see their face light up when they get to do something they never thought they were able to do, um, like those moments became so much more rewarding and uh, things that I look forward to versus like, oh, man, that felt terrible or their frame mm -hmm. was down or they missed the turn and um, not really worrying about that so much. Yeah. The first couple of seasons though, I was still like that. And I, and I, <laughs> I apologize to my partners out there and they know and I love them yeah, and yeah. we're still friends. And But I was, I was a terror, man. I was... It's gotta be perfect. Let's I was go. like, I was like, well, let's do it again. And then eventually, halfway through, I was like, wait a minute, what am I doing? Yeah, like, gotta relax, man. Has there ever been a moment where you went on stage, whether it be Dancing with the Stars or your own, some other show, your own show, where you felt like I'm not fully prepared? Like we didn't practice enough. Uh, the dancers don't know their steps two hours ago. Yeah. Uh, have you ever felt that way? Oh yeah. Really? Oh, so much. So many times. How do you? Go out there knowing you're not ready. Uh, just, and just wing it. Really? <laughs> just, well, here's the thing. The, the first two tours I did with my sister, yes. 
I learned the whole show in two days. Shut up. Two days. And and it was on the stage where we were performing it. And sometimes I was doing the routine the night before in the lob, hotel lobby before we were on Come stage on. in front of 5,000 people. And it was, it didn't go great sometimes. Really? But I realized, I was like, as long as you're enjoying it, even if it goes wrong, the audience are with you. Mm. They're with you. You know, if you go into this like, oh, it's the, the audience feels that, you know, and so it's this, it's this, uh, hey, that that didn't go quite right, and you acknowledge it. You're just like, hey, and the audience are like, hey, that's awesome. You know, it's like it's like somebody on SNL yeah, yeah. laughing in a skit or something. You know, they're like, oh, this is this is actually amazing. This is actually yeah. pretty fun, and it's it's a personal, you know, and it's 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 human, it's real. Mm-hmm. Um, but also to being a dancer, and I guess is sometimes good in life as well, but. You know, it's uh, you're going to make mistakes. Mm-hmm. You know, and at least when you're competing, it was for me. It was about like, how well can I recover from those mistakes, right? How how well can I? Ooh, I missed that. Let's get back into it, and then mm-hmm. let me get back on balance. Let me get back into, you know, my center. Because um, if you get frantic about it, if you hold on to that mistake, you know, it's you become slow, sluggish. Mm-hmm. You're missing more steps. Um, so you you have to learn to let go of mistakes in a routine in order for yourself to get back to center. Mm-hmm. And I think that's kind of, you know, yeah, good in life. Speaking of getting to center, when you have accomplished so much from a young age, for the last 15 plus years now, you've been on a, a global stage, at least a national stage and a global stage in different areas of your career. How do you stay centered and grounded and not allow ego to take over when you're winning everything and on covers of magazines and you know celebrity gossip about you know oh, all man. the things all the opportunities and people feeding into the ego of like how amazing you are how have you stayed centered or grounded or maybe you haven't uh, you know at certain points sure. but what's the process there to staying grounded um, with success yeah I, I you know for me i feel like i've i've never got too carried away with with all that, you know, mm. to be honest with you, I think maybe that's my competitive side of me where I feel like, like we said before, like it's still not good enough or uh-huh. there's still more to do. And um, it, I listen, I, I appreciate like the, the accolades and I love like hearing people, you know, who appreciate what I do. And, um, but you're never, again, I go back to the, te- the student thing. I'm a forever yes. student. I love learning and I think that it's hard at least for me, I think that it's hard for me to allow myself to get to a place like that because I always feel like I'm, I'm constantly growing and I'm, I'm wanting to learn more. And I'm in this sort of state of like, not like, hey, I'm the guy, I know everything, yeah. and like, you're all lucky, you know? It's like, right, right, right. Never like that. And also, you're never mm-hmm. realizing that you're never as big as, you are individually never as big as like, like the project or oh. the show, whatever you're working on. I'm here to serve. I'm here to like... How can I make this better? How can I make this? How can I give myself to this audience and make them feel great in a certain mm. way? Not how can they love me more and mm. appreciate me? That's not it, you know. And I think uh, that keeps me super just motivated, That's you know, cool. to give. But I also think to having a family, you know, in uh-huh. earlier years because when you're a teenager and you know things are going great, you you start to feel a certain way about yourself perhaps, right. but but that would be quickly. Your family keeps you grounded. That yeah. would be instantly. Uh, you know, little Derek. You know. <laughs> instantly checks. Yeah, yeah, of yeah, course. Never allowed to even go there, yeah. <laughs> yeah. What do you feel like is um, something that's missing in your life that if you were able to tap into it more would give you more abundance, freedom, peace, love, intimacy? Is there is there anything missing or? Mm. You know, I, I don't necessarily think there's something missing. I think there's some things I can, I can water more. I can grow mm. on more. You know, I think that there's things that I um, can definitely improve on and, and dive deeper into. Um, What's one thing that resonates with you right now? You, you know, think about it? man, I think going back to the idea of like execution, mm-hmm. And um, hmm, that's a good question. I'm just trying to think about it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> What's one thing that I think dive in deeper? Yeah, internally, I mean, something internally. 
Because you're an execution machine. Because because here's because here's what's interesting with me, like, because here's the thing. Usually, I would usually say my relationship, uh-huh. a relationship like intimacy and yeah. things like that. And I think that that's been something that's been missing in my life so for so long. True intimacy, true mm. love, and I feel like I'm in a place now in my life where that has. I feel, I feel like it's there, and it's it's beautiful, and it's, wow. I feel very like. Oh, that's been sort of the, that's been a piece that's been missing for so long. Um, yeah. So, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> you know, it's interesting. Your body language shifted, right? When you, this is the first time you sat back. Sat back. I know. I'm, I'm like, this is my. Uh, but, why, but why do you think that something shifted when I was I think it was in my pondering. I think it was like. You know, it's interesting, actually. I think because there's a, there's a groundedness about it. Mm. I think maybe. You know, here I'm. I'm like I'm yeah. engaged. Yeah, yeah. My body language here. I, f- I feel really grounded, and I yeah. think that um, at ease, at peace, at peace, at really? ease. Like like of of feeling like if nothing were to happen, no other things happen in life. Like I'll be everything's be okay. Wow. You know what I mean? Like um, because of a of quality intimate relationship. Yeah. Yeah. There's a beauty about that. That's and I think, interesting, man. I will say it's pretty. It's pretty hilarious the amount of comments. There's just like, when are you popping the question? Oh, like all the that? time, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You get that all the time, don't you? All the time, all the time. Um, I think. Is, I think. We, I think people should never pressure a man to make that decision. Yeah. As men, we should say, "This is a decision I want to make in this moment, or when I'm ready." And, and lean into it because we want to make it, not because we're pressured sure. by society or friends or family. Yeah. Like, you got to do this now. Yeah, no, it's, no. That's not the right thing for people, I don't yeah. think. I, I think you can encourage depth of the relationship and growth and these things, mm-hmm. but pressuring someone to make that decision. Well, here's what's interesting. Like, usually, what, at least what I've seen in relationships is, you know, people, they get like in it and then they get married. And this is not every relationship. Like, Sometimes too quick. Well, they get in a relationship. And then there's lots of trials and tribulations and things that go through. They go through a lot. And, you know, sometimes it doesn't work out. And sometimes mm-hmm. it does. Mm-hmm. The way I've looked at it is, like, we've gone through so many different versions of our relationship in the past six years. Sorry, my eye is twitching. You good? I wonder what uh, that means. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you're, uh, the stress of the uh, pressure of getting married. Uh, yeah. um, no, but I think we've gone through so many different versions of our relationship uh-huh. over the past six years and so many ups and downs and so many the beautiful things that have really just they, you know, deepened our relationship mm. that I know that when that day comes mm. that there's going to be no doubt right. that there's nothing we can't get through. Right. There's going to be no doubt that, you know, what we do is, is going to be forever and, mm. and uh, a beautiful thing and... And, uh, yeah, yeah, it's awesome. It's exciting, man. Yeah. Do you, what do you think is possible for a man when they create that intimate connection with someone, their partner, that they deepen and strengthen and, and evolve over time as opposed to being single as a man? What do you think is possible from you single, Derek, to now you committed, intimate, you know, expanding growth in an sure. intimate relationship? What's possible on that side versus where you were? Single, kind of all over the place, having fun. I think possible is the possibility, at least for me, what I feel, what I see is, is just consistent, consistency of happy, <laughs> of happiness. Not just consistency yeah. in relationship, but consistent happiness and mm. consistent joy, because an amplification, where I feel like experiences are amplified because you're sharing them with somebody. You know, one thing I love about Haley is like we love adventures. We love going on these amazing trips, and we'll go. Just diving and she's down 40 feet and I'm like oh well I gotta go go be down there with her and it's just it's really great to experience these things together and mm-hmm. so for me the it's not necessarily just the possibilities of like what it does for like business or creativity all these things for me it's the possibility of just the quality of life mm. that I feel like you know at least for me I was I was sort of searching for and, and looking for in other things um, but there there is a, a, a breath there's a breath, there's an ease, there's a groundedness yeah, that's man. there. Especially, and she's a very like grounded person too. Mm. I don't know if you could tell, but I'm yeah. I'm very airy. I'm like, <laughs> I'm up here, you know what I mean? And she's very whoo, here. Yeah, so it's a good combo. Um, and 
Yeah, it, it's interesting because I have friends like who um, they'll be in this relationship or this relationship, and they're dating. And they're like, "Oh man, I, I want to be in a long-term relationship." And and I just said, I, I said, "Dude, you gotta stop, stop with the, having the appetizers." I know, man. Like meaning, and I don't say that yeah, as yeah. talking about women like that at all. I have four sisters. Like my respect for women is, you know, um, but it's more in the sense of. Be on your own. For yes. A bit. Be on your Don't own. Jump in this, yeah, yeah, yeah. Be on your own and like love yourself, figure yourself out, find yourself, and gain that appetite for like, r- like love mm-hmm. and depth and deeper connection. Depth, like yeah, get yourself the appetite for that, and and it's just, yeah. At least that's kind of what I felt like I did. At least where it helped me, you that's know, good. from being sort of dating, so, you know, a serial dater to stepping back, being sort of on my own for a while, and then allowing myself to. You know, be ready for to it. To dive in. Yeah. It's a, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's exciting, man. I've got a couple final questions for you. Yeah. Love, love our time together. I love how, how real you've been and how just open and honest. It's been really inspiring, yeah, Derek. Yeah, really. Um, before I ask the final questions, people got to follow you, DerekHuff.com, Derek Huff on Twitter. Well, Derek Huff on Twitter, is, uh, on Instagram, Twitter, yeah. and TikTok. All the things, Derek, Derek Huff. Huff. That's it. Yes. Uh, follow him on TikTok if you want to be inspired, if you want to laugh, if you want to be, you know, get some creative ideas. I think inspiration is the wrong word. I think inspired, <laughs> inspired to be a dork yourself. That's it. Yeah, 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 to yeah, be yeah. authentic yeah. self. <laughs> yeah, people just need that. People need that, man. You know, I, it's literally, I'm just like, yo, just have fun with just it, man. Be a goofball. I think it's that's okay. part of life, man. It's okay. Um, but one of the coolest experiences I've ever done is been to your live performances. I think I saw two of them with you and Jules. But you're doing your own. Yeah. Here in Vegas. Uh, coming up September 22nd through, tw- through November 22nd. It's yeah. called No Limit Derek Huff, right? No Limit, yeah. No Limit, baby. No Limit. Let's go. <laughs> so September 22nd through November 22nd, if you're in Vegas or make a trip to Vegas, they can see your show. Where can they get tickets to that? How can they? Yeah, go to Ticketmaster. Ticketmaster um, that's it, right? Ticketmaster.com. Go to Ticketmaster.com, yeah. yeah um, and it's at the Venetian Hotel. Okay. Uh, and, yeah, it's a great night. And this show is, like, live band, the an all-star cast of dancers. Mm. I mean, these dancers I, I picked from, you know, they won World of Dance. Wow. They were, like, first place. They're on your show. Yeah. On the show you were judging. Yes. That's and, like, cool. And they, you know, are just extraordinary dancers, like, wow. beyond. Of course, Haley's going to be dancing on the show as well, and she's sensational. Um, but it's, it's they're singing in it, it's like... You're gonna sing? Yeah, like it's a big band music. That's cool. Actually, B- Michael Buble, he sent me all of his tracks, his Shut authentic um, musician uh, stems. So the music just sounds so full. Wow. And, uh, Motown music, rock and roll, you know, Latin, salsa, tango, uh, contemporary. I mean, every different genre you could think of. It's something for everybody. And um, it's just, a, it's a great night. And, and we, we, we dance, man. And Hard. It's, you're it's sweating, full, you're tripping, you're... It's full out, and it's so much fun. And, uh, yeah, it's I'm It's an athletic really proud performance. Of it. It's like you guys are full-on athletic yeah. performance. Yeah. It's, it's top notch. It's 90 top minutes? Notch. What is this, like a 60, 90 minute performance? Yeah, and, and it's the, different about Vegas is there's no intermission. Oh, man. It's just like straight through... And um, yeah, it'll be like it'll be like an hour twenty. That's amazing. Um, but just nonstop, you know, action. Uh, but it's gonna be a lot of fun. A lot of fun. You definitely need to go check it out. It's I'm excited, great. man. I'm gonna be there for sure, at least yeah. one night, if not yeah. two. I'm gonna bring some <laughs> friends. Uh, so check Derek out September 22nd through November 22nd. Called No Limit Derek Huff. You can get it on his Instagram and Twitter. You'll be linked up to it as well. Yeah. Um, so make sure you guys check that out. This this question I ask everyone at the end. It's called the Three Truths. Uh oh. So imagine, it's a hypothetical scenario. So imagine it's your last day on earth many years away. Okay. You get to live as old as you want to live. And you've accomplished, yeah, <laughs> you've accomplished everything you want to accomplish. Okay. You've lived the great life. But for whatever reason, everything you've ever created has to go to another place. All your dance, your videos, this interview, your book, all these things have to go somewhere else. No one has access to your content. Okay. But you have a piece of paper and a pen, and you get to write down three lessons that you've learned in your life that you would leave to the world. Mm. I call it the three truths, mm. the three lessons you would leave behind. And this is all we have to remember you by. 
Oh my gosh. What would you say would the, be those three lessons or those three truths without being prepared? What's, what's, what's resonating with you in the moment? I think, man, and I just, I'm just, I'm just a walking infomercial for Tony. Man. <laughs> I love it, man. I'm telling you. Um, but, I, uh, but truly, some of the things have really stuck with me and really changed my perspective dramatically. And really, in really dark times, have really changed my perspective almost instantaneously. And one of them was trade your expectations for mm -hmm. appreciation. Mm -hmm. We've heard it before, it's, but it's something that when you really sort of apply, it's an absolute game changer. Yeah. And, that, and that applies to everything, mm -hmm. everything, like your environment, especially your relationships. You know, for me, like if, whenever there's a, a fight or there's an argument or something happens, there's usually an expectation that's not being met. Mm -hmm. And so you realize, okay, how do I switch this? How do I appreciate this person right now? How do I appreciate them listening to me or them being, oh, you know what, they actually did this for me. They, man, game changer. So. Yeah, that's number one. That's number one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> man. Um, I, I feel like, I feel like, I think that like, you're enough. Mm -hmm. You always have been and you always will be. And I think that's important too, that it's not just you're enough, it's you always have been and you always will be. Yeah. I feel like that that's, that for me has been really powerful as well because mm. it's just a reminder of like, hey man, that kid or those things that ever happened to you, when you look back, you are enough. You already were enough. Yeah. Already. And you are now. And you always will be. That's big. So I think that that one and the third one, drink lots of water. <laughs> <laughs> Stay it's, hydrated. It's true, man. Stay hydrated, man. No. Um, That's a good lesson, though. <laughs> I know, right? Stay hydrated. Uh, I go back to this one again because it's just, I just it's a, such a go-to. But, you know... Um, Yeah, I think that I think one of them would be what the world isn't isn't happening to you; it's happening for you. Mm -hmm. That's another one that I've heard that was so powerful for me because we fall into that victim mode. You know, why is this happening to me? Why did that happen to me? And it goes back into the "What if your enemy is your angel?" So I'm like, well, how did that happen for me? You know, what lesson did I learn from that? Mm -hmm. um, how can I grow from that? So those have been really key, pivotal things that have helped me in my life that I would love to, mm. you know, carry on and, and share yeah. and pass on. Those are great, man. This has been inspiring. Um, again, I want people to follow you everywhere on social media, Derek Huff, especially on TikTok. <laughs> and uh, go to the show. I'm telling you, if they go to the show, yeah. text me or message me on Instagram or Twitter with a photo that you're there and you're going to be... Uh, inspired i'm telling you it's gonna be worth the show so make sure you guys go and tell your friends to go um i want to acknowledge you derek for again the transformation you've had i think i've known you for like five six years like, maybe yeah. like we've hung out a little bit here and there but it's been more over the last couple of years here and there and it's fun because i see your transformation in myself because i see how i've continued to grow and evolve through adversity and heartache and yeah. things like that. And I you know, I know other things off camera that we've talked about that you've grown into a different person and it's really inspiring to witness the growth. Thank you brother. Because I think some people might think that you just had it all figured out and things are perfect in your life and yeah. you've got no problems because you're successful and you look good and you've got this amazing <laughs> blue eyes and all these things. <laughs> but we all go through challenges and adversity. Mm -hmm. And um, to know that you've been doing the intimate, vulnerable work for yourself, the inner work mm. to improve, to grow, uh, to be more connected to people is really inspiring. So I acknowledge you not only for the incredible uh, athletic human that you are, the the god, the, the athletes from the god that you are, uh, <laughs> but and the creativity you bring to the world and the joy and the passion, but for you growing as a human being and as a man. So I really acknowledge you for Thank that. You, it's really inspiring, man. It means a lot. Thank you, my man. Uh, this is the final question. What's your definition of greatness? Definition of greatness. Um, 
Definition definition of greatness. Hmm. Wow. My brain goes crazy because there's so many things you could possibly say, I guess. And that's probably why you asked that question. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, What's it mean for you? I think, honestly, the definition of greatness for me is... And I, I'm just trying to find a way to make it a little bit more... Well, I'm just going to keep it streamlined. But it really is... is is serving others. It really mm-hmm. is. I feel like that to be truly great is to is to lift others. Mm-hmm. I think in, in, in any sense of the word, you know, um, in a career, in a relationship, in your family. Um, and at least for me, that's when I feel the most great yeah. or the most aligned with myself is when I'm helping somebody. Um, so yeah, I feel like it would be You'll be serving in some way. And it, by the way, it doesn't have to be huge, yeah. a huge gesture. Right. It could be a small, small gesture, just like listening to somebody. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I think that that would be my definition of greatness. That's it. Jack Huff, my man, yeah. appreciate you. Thanks, Thanks brother. Man. Good stuff. Man. Appreciate you. The reason why it was so difficult too is because like I was then, I then started to make music about it, right? Because I make, I've always made music about every single thing that I went through. I went, made music about having no money, being extremely poor and feeling unloved. And then I, I, I would make music about how to juggle millions of dollars and a giant staff and being on tour constantly, da, da, da. And then so it kind of shifted to like,